Okay. Hey everyone, what is the good word? Today with me, I have Christine Harrington. She does a lot of good things in this world for small businesses, helping them make calls. It's one of the things that a lot of people dread and Christine is going to help us to get through that today. So Christine Harrington, welcome to the Sales Made Easy podcast. What's the good word? Hey, Harry, thank you so much for having me on. It's a real honor to be with you. And um, the good word is you have to practice when you're selling. <laughs> oh, my goodness. There is so much that you just said right there about practice. I can think of one time uh, to kick this off. I was to make this very important call. And I bumbled through it completely, stuttering and stammering. And then I just hung up the phone and I was new on the sales job. My managers looked at me in horror and he says, you should have hit pound. And I'm like, what does pound do? Because I didn't know. And he says, that will allow you to erase what you just said. I'm like, well, they're going to have a fun message. <laughs> so yes, practice. So talk to me, Christine, what is it you do? Because we're going to get into that and how great... Uh, you can help people and stuff, but what is it you do? And what, yeah, just let's go with that. Okay. So um, I have four decades in selling, mostly insurance, uh, corporate insurance sales. So back in the day, my business is 10 years, will be 10 years old. So back in the day, I would have brokers and producers come to me and say, How are you getting into these large groups? Uh, large businesses to sell group benefits. And so I started coaching them on my strategies. Um, so I thought, why am I giving this away for free? <laughs> and I transitioned into a, um, a business platform of sales coaching and training. The crux of that, Harry, was at the time I was with Principal Insurance a uh, Company, the principal insurance company. My dad was in hospice dying and my boss wouldn't let me off work to be with my dad when he was dying. I had four weeks vacation, wasn't allowed to take it. And uh, she said, I could see my dad before work or after work. And I said, I am not letting my dad die alone. Right. Um, tidied up all my work, my desk. I tried to appeal to HR, to her boss, kept getting the same message. So I tidied everything up and I left. My dad died two weeks later and I was by his side. I told him I took two weeks vacation. Mm. So yeah. I didn't want him to know anything. So after that, uh, my dad was my buddy, Harry. Mm. And he taught me to love football. And I watched football every Sunday with him. Bart Starr and Vince Lombardi, the Green Bay Packers. Wow. So that puts me way back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. And so um, as a result, I decided that I was going to start my own coaching business because I had producers calling me saying, what happened to you? Where are you? Um, tell me how you got such and such deal. And so I started my own sales coaching and training business. And it's now a decade long. And of course, I do uh, coaching, I do training, and I also do cold calling for small businesses. Because Harry, as you know, everybody hates cold calling. And I happen to love it. Um, but during COVID, when all my workshops were shut down, because they were all live in front of people, I had to do something, you know, to make up that revenue. So I started reaching out to small businesses and cold calling for them. Oh, my goodness. So you live what you preach. Yes, yes. Yeah, which is really cool. So where do we start with this? What's the big challenge or what are some of the challenges that people have with making phone calls? Well, the biggest one is call reluctance. So they they it's like this phone or their desk phone weighs a thousand pounds <laughs> and they they will give them every excuse under the sun not to make those calls 
Yeah. And of course, you have heard, you know, that cold calling is dead. No, it's no, not really? dead. Oh, <laughs> yes. yeah. Cold I've heard that a few hundred dead. times. Yes. Right, right. And really, what the people that say that, what they're saying is they're lousy at cold calling. Mm. So it is dead to them. Yeah. And I used to be Harry, I was the worst co caller ever. I was embarrassingly bad. And I decided that if I was going to survive, I was going to have to learn how to co call. Mm -hmm. So it took me about a year, about two decades ago, to really understand, well, actually longer than that, three decades ago, to really understand how to co call and how to be effective mm -hmm. when co calling. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, the the call reluctance is uh, is definitely a, a thing, and people, of course, they're hearing all of this negativity that cold calling is dead. But I think people even struggle on making very warm calls. Oh yes, because yes. they they just don't want to interrupt people and they don't want to appear pushy. So it sounds like you agree with that. So what's what can people do? Let's just start there. Let's start with how can we help people just make some calls that are actually pretty warm and that might generate some business quicker sooner rather than later. What's your thought with that? So I always tell people, I coach people, if you have call reluctance, just make one call today. That's it. Just make one call. And depending on how that call makes, if you feel like making another call, make two calls. You know, tomorrow, make one call. So start out with just one call. But before you pick that phone up to make a call, write out a script. You're not going to sit and read the script. You're going to write that script out and you're going to practice it 10 to 15 times, record it in your voice memo on your iPhone, Listen back how you sound, because that's how the prospect will hear you. Mm. And that's so important for you to know how that prospect is going to hear you. I even to this day, Harry, I'll practice 10 to 15 times before I pick that phone up. I'm warming up my voice. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, getting in the mindset. I'm getting in the rhythm. And so then I engage the phone. So it's just like a football player would never go cold <laughs> out on the field to play a game. They always have their warm up first. We as salespeople need to put ourselves in that elite position because that's what we are. We're elite salespeople. So even the best salespeople practice. That's beautiful. And, you know, I, I think, and for those who don't agree with you, I'll tell you that I used to joke around on the first calls I'd make in the morning because I would call somebody, I would butcher the call. And then after doing this a number of times, I said, you know what, I should start a list of the people who are unfortunate enough to get my first call of the day and start all over those people because I bet there's opportunity there if I was halfway decent instead of, you know, butchering the the pitch or whatever I was trying to do on the call. So, yeah, right, it makes perfect right. sense. Well, even last week, Harry, when I was cold calling, I made a call. Uh, I had a call coming in on my phone at the same time. I got distracted. And when when the decision maker picked up, I totally fumbled the whole thing. And I started laughing. He started laughing. He goes, well, shall we do this again? Oh, my goodness. So good. So Yeah. When you screw up, just own it and make fun of it. Make fun of yourself. And, uh, you know, I gave him a good laugh. I had a good laugh. It's so it's like people are just regular people when they sense that you're yeah. a regular person, they give you the chance. That's exactly right. Yeah. I love it. I remember uh, coaching a young sales rep one time and uh, he says, I'm really struggling making calls. And so I, I had the little sarcastic wit from the Northeast who I grew up with. 
So he makes a call and it was terrible. It was indeed terrible. And I said, how do you feel about that call? And he says, it was terrible. And I said, yeah, it was terrible. We're laughing about it. I said, here's one. How about we call the person back and say that the last call was terrible. Can I get another chance? And he did. And sure enough, it went perfectly, right? Because the person was laughing on the other end. They probably never had that happen before. And it's just like, hey, life is short. Let's have some fun along the way. And this, we're not saving babies. And when you have an attitude like that, I think you can be fairly successful. Um, what's your thought with just this whole thing, like what we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I am coaching right now four teams of people of ladies for the Televerde Foundation. Um, and they have never done phone work at all. So I'm teaching them how to cold call. And of course, they are all over the place. You know, they, uh, you know, oh, this is so hard. I don't know what to say. And, you know, because I would throw them off. They'd have to role play with me. And I'd throw them off real, with real world um, uh, examples. And so I said, you know, the script is a guide, but you have to be able to come up and this is another thing I do, Harry, when I take on a small business to do the cold calling for them, I want to know every objection you've ever gotten. Then I write out a response to manage that objection. Mm -hmm. See, I don't believe in overcoming objections. I believe in managing the objections. Mm -hmm. So when you manage the objections, you manage the conversation. Oh my goodness. That's so good. So let's dive deeper into that. When you say manage versus overcoming. So mm -hmm. what's, what's an example? Like someone will say, for instance, uh, we're all set. That's a pretty common one, right? Or I'm busy. Um, what's, what is one that really jumps out at you as really common? Well, let's just use we're all set. Okay. Or, I mean, we're all set. Uh, you know, we don't know. We don't need that. Um, yeah. We're not interested. Right away, you come back with or or here's a common one. Hey, I'm headed into a meeting. I can't talk right now. For all of those, you're going to say one thing. Thank you for letting me know. Mm. Then come back with a question. Mm. Thank you for letting me know. Tell me, are there any gaps? and the vendors you're currently using. I mean, whatever it is, the product that you're saying. Mm -hmm. So you're acknowledging that we're all set. Thank you for letting me know. It's a perfect response for every objection you get. You're being respectful and you're also, um, uh, oh, how can I say this? You're being respectful you're also acknowledging that they think that they're set. Now, mm -hmm. we both know that's an excuse. Sure. Right? It's yep. just an excuse. You've interrupted their day, so they're giving you an excuse right off the bat. Another common mistake is salespeople's intros are all over the place. Your intro has to be very tight and concise four sentences at the most, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's just, just the, the thank you for letting me know is, is beautiful. Um, you know, what sometimes people feel is when a person says they're all set, and I've heard people say, well, I make calls, people say they're not interested, I've got zero appointments and all of this stuff, right? It's because they haven't really developed the skills. Yes. It's so like you, you, when people view sales as a numbers game, and I get the whole thing that you have to have numbers, right? You have to have activity. But if you treat everything like a number, you get through the number and you're not dealing with the person in front of you. Mm -hmm. Right. So if someone says, my goal today is to make whatever the number of calls, I got to make 10 calls. I had to make a hundred calls. So pick a number. If you're thinking that you have to make X number of calls, you sometimes lose sight of the person that is alive and speaking to you. And if we develop some skills 
where we can say things comfortably. Thank you for letting me know. Let's say that 50 times or 20 times till we get very comfortable with thank you for letting me know. And then you ask a question, right? Because now people are just completely thrown off by the fact that you stayed, thank them. And now you're asking a question that's like, they don't know where to turn, which is, which is a good thing because you're there to serve them. That's What's right. your thought, that's right. right? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right, Harry, because the last thing you want to do is, um, as you said, see that person as just another phone call number you have to make to make your boss happy, right? So uh, instead, when you say thank you for letting me know, that almost is a, um, a compassionate response, right? So now they see you as a human being. And, and I have had so much success with that one line. And instead of pushing, like I hear so many times, uh, I've heard salespeople say, uh, no, we're all set. Well, wait, before, before you say that, listen to what we have to offer or something aggressive like that, you know? And the other mistake is they start selling instead of asking questions. And why do you ask questions? Okay. You ask questions to warm the, the, the prospect up to talk to you. You ask questions to uncover, is this prospect a fit or not? But your only goal, your only goal in cold calling is to set an appointment. That's mm. it. Yeah. And if someone starts asking you questions, you can say, that's very, those are very good questions. When we meet, I would be happy to give you in-depth discussions on all of those questions and get them answered for you. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Don't start yeah. selling right then and there because yeah. they don't know you and they don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so this this thought that's coming to me right now is about the uh, pace of your conversation. So when, it, when people who are nervous and are making calls, they just want to get as much out, it seems like, especially newer ones, you want to get as much out as possible before the person says no, or before the person says, I'll, I'm all set. So they've got this really fast pace. It's uncomfortable. The person who's listening is like, I, I'm just going to wait until there's a pause so I can say I'm not interested. What's your feeling about pace and conversational quality when you're making your, you know, when you're introducing yourself, uh, speaking to somebody? Well, pace is important. <clears throat> you don't want to sound like you're off to the races, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of people, when they're nervous, they start talking faster. So I always coach uh, salespeople to pretend you're picking up that phone and you're calling a good friend. Mm. Your tone should be casual and friendly. Your words professional, but pretend you're talking to a good friend. Hello, Lit. Hello, Harry. This is Christine with the Savvy Sales Lady. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so like even that, where you're, you know, when you're thinking about uh, calling a good friend, that puts you in the mindset of, this is not a life or death situation, right? right? We put too much pressure on ourselves and that comes across. So thinking about the positive potential outcomes, I used to think along the lines that this person could become a good friend of mine. And so I'm going to go in with that thinking and a lot of times, not a lot of times, but a number of times, you know, that comes across with a very pleasant conversation. So Continue with where you're going about calling a friend. Yeah, so it would sound something like, hi, Harry, this is Christine Harrington with Widget WABC. We sell widgets to help businesses grow. Harry, are you still the sales manager for your team? 
I am, but Christine, I'm, we're really all set with the widgets that we currently have. Well, thank you for letting me know, Harry. I get that. What would be the gap in your widget portfolio? Well, we really don't have anything in the mid range. We're very good on the low end and really great on the high end, but yeah, there's a little, little gap in the mid range. Well, can you tell me more about what you're missing in that mid range? Yeah, we really don't have a newer product. And, you know, it's been a while. So we're a little behind the eight ball on that. I know that uh, they're in development and looking at things, but uh, yeah, it's been a while in coming. So we're, we're making do. I see. So if I hear you correctly, you do have a gap but you haven't fully explored it yet. So would there be another person that might be vital for us to talk to and bring into the conversation? Yeah, this is really Bill Smith's area. I mean, if you want, I could uh, you know, pass you over to him. Okay, that would be great. Uh, what is Bill's phone number and email? Yeah, and I'll give you that, right? Okay, and so one more thing, Harry. Would you make an introduction for me to Bill so he won't be blindsided like I blindsided you on this call? <laughs> yeah, you seem to be a nice enough person. I'll be happy to do that for you. Okay, thank you, Harry. <laughs> nice approach. Ta-da! Yes, that, that, ladies and gentlemen, is a woman with some experience and skills in calling. So much good there. Right, so you... You're asking the question, you're getting a second level question there, right? Which tells me something that you're an educated caller, which okay. there's value. And if you're not an educated caller, then I'm probably not going to want to help, help you help me. Right. And mm -hmm. then, right. And so then the, uh, you know, asking that and then recognizing that I don't have the answer now you've got a live person. And instead of saying, this guy obviously doesn't know, I can ask if he can get me somebody and I can use that, and move myself further inside the business and provide um, some help that way. And then the third thing is asking what, well, getting a phone number and email, which is perfect, right? So that's the third thing, because now you've got two ways to communicate. And then the fourth thing, is I think they're four, but whatever the last thing is getting that warm introduction. So yes. I'm going to look at this call and say, if you're one of my sales reps, you didn't get the appointment, but we got a lot of great info. That's right. Right. And that great info has got to go somewhere because if you're making a lot of calls, you're not going to remember this. So what is it you suggest to do next? Um, okay. What, in what step? To okay. Do so what, after, after the phone, after the hang up, you call the other person, they're not there and we won't go into that, but now you have all okay. this stuff in your mind. What do you do with it? Okay. So before I call the other person, I'll prepare a voicemail script in case I get a voicemail. Mm, nice. All right. Yeah. So I always keep my voicemails very um, short. Okay. So I, I, I'm just talking off my top of my head now. Yeah. But, but brevity might... is good because yeah. after a certain period of time, people are going to, you know, say this is too long. So when you think if... of brevity, what comes to mind for you? 20 seconds. At yeah. The beautiful. Most. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say max 30 seconds. So yeah. So yeah. even better. 20 seconds. Okay. So now what I do that's use that's unusual is um, at least to the people I coach, it seems unusual. Um, I will leave the voicemail message, then immediately turn around, put the same message in an email. Hmm. And I'll say something like, um, uh, Bill, hello, Bill, I just left you a short voice message for your convenience. I thought I'd drop you the same message in an email. Harry asked that I give you a call. And then, you know, I just very short, very short. Mm -hmm. 
about your gaps and widgets very short. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I, uh, this is the most important thing when you're doing email. And everybody does this and it makes me crazy. <laughs> they <laughs> okay. say, I can't wait. They say, let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> oh my God. You're right. The let me know is just, yeah, okay. Beautiful. So you what, always, what's better? What's better? Yeah, you always in your emails by saying, uh, I'll give you a call on such and such day to see if any questions surface. And then that day, I will send them a reminder email that I'm calling and I'll say, um, you know, just, just a courtesy reminder that I'll be calling at such and such time to answer any questions that may have surfaced. Uh, I'll say, uh, hopefully you'll be available to take my call. Mm -hmm. And then I call. And mm -hmm. if I get voicemail again, then I'll do the whole routine all over again. Yeah. So, because if you don't leave a voicemail on that one, what's the danger? Well, here's a true story. Okay. An office that I worked in, the um, sales rep would never leave voicemails, never. Mm -hmm. And so the person could see from the caller ID where they were calling and they would never leave a voicemail. And he would call two or three times a week. If he got voicemail, hang up. Well, this went on for about a month. And the man uh, called the off, our office, was just infuriated and said, tell them to either leave me a message or quit stalking me. <laughs> yeah, that's great. True story. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it, it, right. We don't know how people are going to respond, but yes. But I was thinking too, is that if you say you're going to do something and you do it at the time you say you're going to do it, that's a check in the plus column. Yes. Right. Because how many, how many surveys have we looked at that says the sales rep only follows up one time? Mm, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. One, one of my specialties other than cold calling is crafting email messages to get the prospect's attention. Mm -hmm. I have a real knack for that for some reason. I don't know why, <laughs> but yeah. um, because you're a personable person, right? You already show <laughs> empathy and compassion. So I'm, I have a feeling that's part of the reason. I, I'm, I'm, I can easily put myself in other people's shoes mm. and try to figure out um, how they will react to a message. You know, I, I, in, in the 10 years I've been coaching, Harry, I have seen absolute patterns of behavior. And, you know, I've heard Tony Robbins talk about this for years. He always talks yeah. about look for the patterns of behavior. Mm. And when I started coaching, I'm going, oh my gosh, he's right. <laughs> there are patterns of behavior. And, and so if people will become more self-aware of their patterns of behavior, they can absolutely stop some of their sabotaging behavior. Mm. On the same token, it also increases your, um, uh, your awareness of how someone else is going to respond as well. True. Yeah. I think they call that emotional intelligence now. I think so. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yeah. This, this whole thing, first of all, when you, when you talk about awareness and self-awareness, so if you're, which is again, part of the, the EQ thing, right? So if you're not feeling up for it, I'm going to go to that thought right where you're feeling like the phone weighs a thousand pounds that nobody's interested that it's drudgery this is one i just uh, was creating a video on that sales is a grind right so when you have all this negative stuff going through your head is that when you want to make phone calls or should you be doing something between that and actually dialing yeah you should be practicing 
Okay. And what else might you do? What do you, what do you do so, to like for attitude and so forth? So when call reluctance, when that phone feels a thousand pounds heavy, what it, what you're dreading is not the phone call. You're dreading you'll screw up. You're dreading you're going to screw the call up. You're dreading that you won't sound professional enough and that now they got your name and, and this is the cold caller that can't make cold calls. So the cure to that is you practice until you feel competent. See, people always go in thinking they're going to puff themselves up and be confident and and kind of bulldoze their way through the phone call. Yep. If you're competent, the confidence will automatically be there. Mm -hmm. Work on being competent. And the only way you can be competent is practice and make the phone calls. So in the beginning, when I got serious about cold calling, it's awful. All right. I can't wait. What a setup this is. You, you're, you're laughing before I get the punchline. All right. Come on. Yeah. Now. So I would take the prospects that I didn't care about at all. <laughs> and I would practice on them. Mm, yeah. So That's not so bad. I would, right. I would <laughs> practice on the ones that I felt like weren't right. a fit for me. Um whatever I was selling at oh, the time. Oh my goodness, yep. And that's, I honed my skills on them. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's like uh, Chris Rock or some comedian going to a uh, open mic night to test out the audience, right? It's not like they really yeah. care, but it's like, they're laughing. I could use this on my performance. So uh, yeah, that makes, that makes perfect sense, actually. And the, Mary, uh, that's a yeah. good point. The professionals do it. Yeah. The professional comedians do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And speakers are not showing up without rehearsing a speech, you know, a whole bunch of times. And this is our livelihood, right? When you're yes. making, like, especially I think on, on the big one is making a follow-up phone call, right? You've had conversations with somebody. They have a proposal out there. And I know that you really focus on the cold calling, but you have to, you have to do what we have to do, right? Because you write business, you have to do all the steps of the sales process. And I imagine you think through them all. So you have an important phone call to make. The person said that they were going to review the proposal. You reviewed it with them. They had to get someone else's input or whatever. And now you need to make the call. Do you make that call with any intentionality or could you be like just uh, sitting down in your office to start the day and say, oh, I got to make this call. I'm going to go call and see what they're thinking about and not do any rehearsal, not review the proposal or I, I know you do, but tell me what is, what is the step? What are the steps you go through? Well, uh, this goes back to my group benefit days and beyond. Um, I used to be the rep that, you know, sent out the proposals, sent out the quotes and, uh, I would, and one night my son had been in, went to bed, was in bed. It was like 10 o'clock at night. I'm going through all my emails and I, and I was like a, a, a boatload, a boatload of emails that never got a response to my quote or proposal. I mean, it, I'm thinking it was like, 60 or 70. It was a lot. And I'm going, what in the world is going on? Why isn't anybody responding? Isn't that what we all say? Why aren't they responding? It's not their job. The job is ours <laughs> to follow up. <clears throat> so that's one light bulb moment I had. <laughs> that is so good. We we blame the person for our bad email or our bad voice yeah. message we're blaming them what's wrong with people today i heard that one a million times i might have said it myself <laughs> okay continue right. so um i started doing this instead uh i 
I would tell them the quote is ready. When is a good time for you, either Monday or Tuesday, that we can have a phone conversation and go over the quote and <clears throat> or the proposal? So I stopped giving the quotes and proposals out and either I talked them through it over the phone or I met with them face to face. So what I would do is when the call, when I was on the phone with them, I would say, okay, I'm gonna send the quote now and let me know when you get it. Okay, I got it. And I said, I, uh, I wanna make sure you can open the attachment. And that was the other reason why I would say that um, I wanted to do this over the phone or in person to make sure they could open the quote because I did have some problems with that. However, not only did they not read my email, they never opened the attachments as well. So I'm like, why am I wasting my time doing this? You know, when I should be the one leading this. So, uh, so then I would have them open up the quote or the proposal. And then I would say, I'd like to bring your attention to line such and such, and then line such and such. And then we would have a conversation. Sold the deal, got the implementation team together to implement it and one down. Yeah, so you are well prepared. Yeah. Right. The key thing here is to be extremely prepared. And I, I'm willing to bet you've heard once or twice where people just say, just send me the proposal. And you might say something along the lines as well. Uh, I really would like to review the proposal so that you understand exactly what we're proposing here or whatever you say. And they say, oh, just send it. I'll figure it out or whatever. What do you do in that case? Maybe it's like the second time that they said, just send it. Uh, I, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, I would say, I would just say, you know, if it's easier for me to drop by your office and review it, um, let's do that. Uh, but my process is that we review it together. Yeah, yeah. And you, you know, have I to tell, you have to tell them your process because they don't know your process. And, and, and Harry, to go one step further, I eliminated that objection because I told them my process. I would do the quote, I'd give you a call or email, let you know when it's ready, and then we'd set up an appointment for the uh, to review the quote. And I would say uh, at the end, um, this is for your benefit. That's why I don't just send out quotes. Beautiful. Magic. So, you 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 over or you manage it in in the front end, letting them know your process because they yeah. don't know your process. Right. And, that's and how. It, okay. That's how I separated myself from other vendors because all they did was just quote 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 quote. Yeah, just exactly. Maps and maps and maps. Well, because some are counting proposals. Yes. And they mm -hmm. have in their mind X number of proposal leads into X number of results. And again, it's a numbers game for them instead of a skills game. And so like this, this, this great idea, which I love. Um, and I just, what the heck was I going to say? It was brilliant. Um, but yes, even the brilliant ones lose their uh, thoughts periodically. Now, let the, me, yeah. let me. Okay. You take over for me. Did you get your me. thought? I did. I had two of them. One was this opportunity of people who had proposals that never did anything. So if you're listening to this podcast, there's money in those hills on people that have proposals. They've never even opened some of them. And they've a lot of them have never done anything. And so calling back those people is an opportunity. What's your thought? I, I, I agree. <clears throat> and you call them up and you apologize. Mm. You apologize for not getting back to them and following up and going through the proposal. You do it that way. Um, let me say this, Harry. Back in the day, I was doing almost 300 proposals a month. 
Mm. So it wasn't possible for me to do all the phone calls, right. follow up, and all of the face-to-face proposals. So you have to be smart about the number of proposals you can do that with and who you want to do that with. Right. Yep. Okay. So let me back up and say that. Now, those of you that have let your proposals um, be neglected, from this day forward, you are the one responsible for delivering that proposal either over the phone or face-to-face or over Zoom. It's your responsibility to go through every part of that proposal with them to close the deal. For the ones that have been neglected, you call them up, you apologize, and you ask to book a time with them, an appointment with them to review that proposal. Hopefully they haven't already gone to another vendor and you can save it. But if you didn't say, if they've already went to another vendor, then ask them for the opportunity to quote it at renewal time Mm -hmm. or a year from now or Mm -hmm. whatever it works in your industry. Ask them for the opportunity down the road. Yeah. And they'll appreciate the fact that you're following up. Again, very few yes. people do. So when right. you do it, it's just uh, you stand out. Christine, this is remarkable. I cannot believe I said we're going to do this for half an hour, like 45 minutes into this. So <laughs> time flies when you're having fun. How can people find more of your superstardom and work with you and all of that? would be uh, very helpful for many, I'm sure. So uh, I go by the Savvy Sales Lady, and I have a, uh, my website is pretty robust, uh, www.christineharrington.com. On, uh, I have over 300 YouTube videos to help you sell. They're free. Uh, that's at the Savvy Sales Lady or, Google, or just search for Christine Harrington. And I have a cold calling course coming out that will be sold on my website and it will go deeper into the words that matter, how to, the words you should be using when you're cold calling, words you should eliminate, and it'll, it'll be cold calling from start to finish. Is that available now or when will that be available? I'm hoping to wrap it up in two months. I had it all on a platform and then I switched it to another platform because it couldn't do what I wanted it to do. So that has been a real headache. (laughs) (laughs) We'll save that for another time. But it sounds like by the time this is being launched that that may be available. So um, so we'll put whatever we have in the show notes so that you folks can find it or at least find Christine and ask about this program so sounds exciting yeah and you know um find me on linkedin send me a direct message if you've got questions if you have questions i'd be happy to answer your questions i love it christine harrington ladies and gentlemen the sav what's it what's the name of the business the savvy sales lady all right the savvy sales lady that's a tongue twister but this has been a blast thank you for dropping the value bombs today christine Thanks, Harry. I appreciate you having me on. Oh, it's great stuff.